first of all, can I just ask you both to um, introduce yourselves and say your name and your, your roles within the NHS? Um, so hi everyone, my name is Brina. Um, I'm a MS specialist pharmacist. I work at the National Hospital for um, Neurology and Neurosurgery um, at the Queen Square MS Centre. Hi everyone, my name is Aoife. Um, I am uh, the principal MS pharmacist at uh, Queen Square at the National Hospital. So my first question is, can you talk a little bit about the role of a pharmacist specifically within an MS team? The role of a pharmacist within an MS service will vary according to the needs of the service. Um, sometimes uh, a hospital will have a neuropharmacist who will have uh, commitments to other clinical areas, or sometimes like Queen Square, um, we ha there are dedicated MS pharmacists um, where we are embedded within the MS service. Um, so our role as MS pharmacists um, is quite varied. Uh, we have a patient facing role, which we would describe as a clinical role. And then we have non-patient facing role where we work with our colleagues and work with service improvement, um, quality improvement, service development, um, and education and research. But our typical patient facing activities and responsibilities would involve screening, checking prescriptions. Um, we run a pharmacist blood monitoring clinic uh, where we oversee blood monitoring for patients on um, disease modifying therapy, perhaps more complex people um, on disease modifying therapy. Uh, we also, with the nurses, uh, run uh, disease modifying drug education and screening clinics uh, where we talk through the medication that the patient is about to begin. Also, we have access to uh, specialist medicines information resources. So we're able to provide our service, um, doctors, nurses, and people with MS with uh, uh, specialist MS medicines information service as well. So that's quite beneficial for our um, entire service. Then all, the non-patient facing role, uh, as I said, will involve contributing to service development uh, and quality improvement within the service. At Queen Square, we also have the opportunity to work with our colleagues across London and nationally, for example, um, contributing to NICE guidelines, um, contributing to education meetings, uh, and we also form networks with other pharmacists so that we can share uh, good practice and also share challenges to try and improve the care um, provided to people with MS. How are you involved in supporting people with MS themselves? So can people with MS talk to you directly about their treatment options, both the disease modifying drugs and the symptomatic treatments they might be on? Yeah, so um, as pharmacists working in a hospital role, um, we're often in the background providing, you know, a supporting role to the nurses and doctors. So unfortunately, sometimes we don't get to meet all of our um patients face to face in a traditional clinic setting however we are in contact with people with MS on a daily basis and available to speak to them if, if they need if they need to speak to us and usually our contact is um, related to their disease modifying treatments like you mentioned so um, might be related to their blood monitoring might be you know they might have questions about interactions with their other medications or herbal supplements or if someone is switching their therapy and also we, we provide advice on symptomatic medications as well. And sometimes that's not just to the patients, but to GPs as well, if they have any queries. Um, and we're always here um, to answer any health related questions as well. And they're commonly around vaccines. And um, so if someone's going traveling, if, if, the, if the vaccines that are, are um, needed are safe for them to take or you know, queries um, regarding contraception, or if medication is safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. So we do, yeah, we do give advice on minor illness and symptoms as well. And we'll refer to non-MS specialists um, if needed, such as we have, you know, quite close links with um, the teams in gynecology, infectious diseases and liver disease as well. Mm -hmm. And what work do you have to do behind the scenes when a new drug gets approved for use on the NHS? Okay, when a new drug is approved and or agreed by uh, the NHS, so by NICE or by NHS England, for example, the disease modifying drugs, um, 
what we do at uh, the National Hospital is that we must inform our use of medicines committee that we are intending to use it at our trust. Um, and then the drug is added to our formulary to be used in line with national guidance. Um, if the medication is a new disease modifying drug, usually a new pathway and a clinical guideline will be agreed by our MS service at the governance meetings. Of course, we must ensure that we have resource to support the prescribing, administration, delivery, and long-term monitoring thereafter. Um, and we also need to give an indication of how many patients are likely to need the drug and whether it will replace um, existing treatment or um, is a new line of treatment. And we must make sure, obviously, that there is funding available for that treatment. Uh, we work collaboratively across the trust. So the MS service, obviously, including our pathway coordinators, home care staff, MS nurses, consultants, daycare nurses, pharmacy staff, pharmacy technicians, to ensure that there's an agreed arrangement for everything from purchasing, um, dispensing, prescribing, administration, delivery, follow-up. So we also communicate and collaborate with our uh, peers um, locally and nationally to share how they're de delivering the same service so that we can agree um, and share good practice, but also discuss how we get around different challenges. Mm -hmm. um, MS, the treatment is rapidly evolving at the moment. It's a rapidly evolving landscape. Um, so we are always thinking months and years ahead um, so that we are aware of what's coming next and so that we can try to plan in advance. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a lot of work that you're sort of secretly doing behind the scenes when, when these drugs get approved in order to make sure that they are there um, when people need them. I don't think people really realise that because it's not really something that they, they, they can see. Um, my next question is around um, sort of misconceptions. So when you're talking to people with MS, are there any sort of misconceptions you come across when discussing medication? So I know from talking to people myself on our inquiry line sometimes people get a bit confused around what we mean by symptomatic treatments versus what we mean by disease modifying drugs that are actually sort of targeting the MS itself are there any sort of misconceptions that you've come across? Yeah so um, all the information around medications and particularly the MS treatments can be quite overwhelming and for example um, one of the misconceptions or sort of the confusing thing is that um, the MS treatments, they have a generic drug name, which is often unpronounceable, even to us, and a brand name, which commonly causes confusion because there's two names. Um, so there's a lot of information to digest and, uh, you know, understand, especially if you're someone who's newly diagnosed and everything is sort of, you know, quite overwhelming. Um, and there's also a huge amount of unregulated information that can be found on the internet. Um, some of the medications that we that our BMS treatments have been used in other areas such as to, to treat cancer. So for example, cladribine um, was, is used in leukemia, ofatumumab and lymphoma. So often if you search for information online, the information around that medication may not be relevant to, to multiple sclerosis. Um, also, as you mentioned, like the disease modifying treatments will not normally improve symptoms like the symptomatic treatments for example like spasticity or pain um, nor do they reverse damage or disease progression um, however most of these symptomatic medications used to treat the MS symptoms can be taken alongside the disease modifying treatments but it's always best to check with their consultant or MS pharmacist um, and we also have a lot of people ask about Sativex which um, whilst, it's, whilst it is available it's restricted for particular indications um, and its benefit is closely monitored. Um, and we also have to be quite careful because medication can cause harm if taken incorrectly. Um, so many people are apprehensive about taking anything at all. So therefore it's our place to ensure that, you know, people take the correct medication and that they provide you with the appropriate support and information where needed. Um, and as MS pharmacists, but that's why we're embedded in the service to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. And my next question, I think um, if you sort of touched on this before, um, so there's been quite a lot of activity in terms of sort of DMDs coming through um, and becoming a, starting to become available. So 
um, um, for both relapsing and progressive MS. So could you um, maybe talk through some of these treatments um, that are starting to come through now and how they compare to some of the other drugs and how popular you think they might be? I know that's quite a big question. Uh, medications um, coming through, so in the pipeline. So we have Ofatumumab, which is a subcutaneous medication that can be administered at home after the first dose. Um, and this is um, this will be a convenient home-based high efficacy medication, especially if people with MS don't want to come into hospital for their treatment, you know, for example, because of the lockdown or it's quite far for them to travel. Natalizumab um, or brand name Tysabri is a high efficacy option now available via the subcutaneous route. So the, the frequency of administration will still be the same. It'll still be every four weeks. Um, and it will still need to be administered in a medical setting, but it will speed up the time spent in hospital as it won't need to be given as an infusion over one hour. Um, and observation time can be reduced um, if the treatment is tolerated. So it's, a, it's an option for those um, you know, who might have difficulty with cannulation or, or difficult intravenous access. Um, Sipodamod so um, or Mazent, which is an oral treatment now, the first one for secondary progressive MS, um, for those who are still having relapses or MRI activity. Um, it's very similar to Fingolimod, um, which is used to treat relapse remitting MS. So we, ha um, we have to be mindful of the side effects, obviously. So, so things like infection risk, particularly if, if we're, um, you know, if, if we're treating people who are you know, have more progression of their disease, perhaps a little bit older, um, and may have, you know, other existing um, medical conditions, or on other uh, medications, as there are uh, many things that it can interact with. In the horizon, there's Penicimod, which is undergoing nice consultation, that's um, for relapse and relapse remitting MS. Um, and there's also deroximal fumarate um, for relapse and remitting MS, which has just been submitted to the EMA for licensing. Um, and the trials have shown that it um, um, has fewer gastrointestinal side effects than dimethyl fumarate, um, which is quite a, you know, um, can sometimes cause stomach upset, constipation, diarrhea when people first start it. So there's lots, lots of treatments on the horizon. So we'll see, obviously, in the next few months, what, um, what comes out first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really nice summary. Um, I think, yeah, a lot of the drugs sort of mentioned there are for the relapsing side of MS. And I think yeah. we are... Uh, we do get contacted quite a lot by people with progressive MS that sort of want updates on where the research is in terms of drugs coming through, through for them. So are there any new drugs in the pipeline for progressive MS? Um, so then we currently have Ocrevus for primary progressive and Mazen for secondary progressive, which you mentioned there. Um, so do you think there'll be more options available for, for pro progressive MS in the future? Um, so, yeah, we're quite optimistic um, that more treatments or repurposing of drugs will be will become available for for progressive disease. Um, so it allows access and benefit for people with primary progressive or more advanced disease. Um, and we're hopeful for positive results from the chariot MS um, trial. So that's looking at if cladribine can slow down the worsening of um, hand and arm function for people with an ad advanced MS. And that has no upper age limit. Um, and there's there's also the OHAN trial as well, which is looking at ocrelizumab effect on upper limit disability progression. Um, and of course, there's STAT2 trial as well, STAT2 trial as well, which is um, led by Professor Chataway as the chief investigator at the National Hospital. So that's looking at whether simvastatin can slow down progression in MS by protecting the nerves from damage. So there's a few trials um, which we're just looking at closely to see if you know, if these do have positive results, then obviously it will be benefit to those with advanced disease. But yeah, we're, we're trying to remain quite optimistic about, you know, more treatments on the horizon. Um, and yeah, I think there is more research going into, you know, more progressive and advanced disease. So yeah, we'll see what comes up. Yeah, I think it's good that we're starting to see sort of more trials that people yeah. can get involved in now, which is good. Um, 
my next question so um how can you support p- people with progressive ms that maybe aren't on a disease modifying drug but they are sort of using a range of symptomatic treatments how can you support those people so this is an area that we are keen to develop um up until now people with ms or people with progressive ms have predominantly been community-based and therefore any interaction with a specialist ms pharmacist would be more reactive for example when they're admitted to hospital for an ailment Um, however now as more treatment options become available which require specialist input and monitoring for example disease modifying drugs and symptomatic um, medication um, we are meeting and learning more about this group of of people Um, and our potential here is to proactively decrease preventable harm mainly caused by problematic polypharmacy so being on too many medications um, and by performing medication reviews going through the medication um, and assessing whether or not they're actually working um, and if they're having some adverse effect that is you know causing someone to feel you know unwell or, or miserable um, so we can look at all of their medications and they may be on quite a few Uh, and ensure that they're getting the best from each medication and if necessary switch or stop the medications that aren't working or causing unpleasant side effects. So our priority is to try and make sure that people get the right medication at the right time. I think that's quite nice to hear because I think people with progressive MS sometimes feel like they're sort of left to sort of deal with their MS themselves but if they've got sort of the option to speak to a pharmacist to actually review the medications they're on and see what's working and see what's not working or maybe what's interacting then that can be really really helpful that they have got that little bit of support there. Um, My next question um, was around sort of prescription charges for DMDs so we often get contacted by people who aren't sure whether they'll have to pay a prescription charge and I I feel like it's a little bit hit and miss. Some people that have it delivered to their home don't have to pay and then some people that go to collect them do so can you provide any sort of clarity on that? Yeah, <clears throat> so having MS is, um, is not a prescription payment exemption. So although if someone is exempt for other reasons that they, they would not need to pay, so because of their age or other medical conditions. Um, but like you said, it can be quite confusing. So all medications that are delivered by um, home delivery, so home care companies such as Healthcare at Home or Lloyd's Pharmacy, they don't need to pay for. Um, if a medication is... Um, administered during a hospital admission, for example, um, natalizumab infusion, they don't need to pay for that. Um, And if if a medication is um, given to go home with, which is linked to a hospital admission, um, they also don't need to pay for that as well. So for example, um, people that come in for alimtuzumab treatment, they have antibiotics or antivirals that they go home with, and they don't need to pay for that, sorry. Um, However, there is, um, if a medication is dispensed using an outpatient prescription, for example, after a clinic visit, um, or if they um, collect their medication from the hospital pharmacy, then they will be charged an NHS prescription fee. Um, So I hope that provides some clarity. But yes, it is quite confusing. Um, But they can always discuss this with the pharmacist if there's a, you know, a better way or, or that we can sort of um, provide the medication for them um, mm. but majority of our medications are provided via home delivery so um, you know that it's just more convenient for our patients it gets delivered to their home so they don't have to collect it from our pharmacy. Mm. 